Yeah, I decided to mix it up a little bit, right? On the uh, on the tunage. Not that uh, Foo Fighters isn't always a good idea, but sometimes you need a little Mozart for the soul. Hey, how's everybody doing? What's happening? Everybody ready for this whole thing to be over? I'm so ready. I am so freaking ready. I expect everybody else to be equally ready. The, uh, the meme from Mr. Seeds is so disturbing that I don't even know what that's all about. <laughs> You know what it reminds me of? You know the little squeeze toys where the eyeballs bulge out, you know? Yeah, yeah, the stress. Is it stress ducts? There, there are not, I don't know what they are, but yeah, something like that. Okay, everybody, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. We're going to finish talking about uh, intellectual property and then just talk about kind of the topic is employment. We're okay on audio, I take it. There's some kind of a... Man, what is it? What is it? Oh, no, I know what it is. There was a key in Peel um, uh, where... Uh, hang on a second. I'm going to... Some instructions on the paper. Commanding... I got a hot mic. Okay, let me see. I got a link. I'm going to drop it in. And uh, just a second. I've got a... Okay, so I've got a, a shot, uh, a still shot of what I'm talking about. And then I've got a link for everybody to watch this instead of listening to me if that's what you want to do with your life. Okay, so this is, that's the key and peel. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend key and peel. As a general pattern for life, I do recommend key and peel. Um, but, uh, and then this is what I'm talking about right here. <clears throat> right there that thing features that thing is featured in this video oh. all right okay um let me get the slides up we were talking about intellectual property any 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 like hot takes anybody anything we need to hit Anybody there? Any, anybody? Yeah, I'm listening. <laughs> Thank you, Denver. Okay. Intellectual property. Let's do it. We were talking about something. Probably something cool. This is before Thanksgiving. Um, so... <clears throat> question is where did we get to we talked about here's what we talked about intellectual property these mondo topics 
many much topics. Um, and I think we were talking quite a bit about patents. And did we talk about copyright? Uh, anybody remember? I should remember. I mean, I was the one talking, but you were the ones listening with rapt attention. So um, I think that we did the patent thing. And then, then I think we got distracted showing you like crazy patents for exercising a cat with a laser pointer or uh, Eddie Van Halen, who was the actual inventor. Uh, in addition to being an amazing guitarist. Um, and what else? Linked list patent. Um, I'm pretty sure we hit that. And I want to say we got to here. Does that seem reasonable? Any Anybody confirm or deny on that? You guys are more quiet than you're more quiet than normal. It's okay. We're all, I think we're all exhausted, exhausted, exhausted. We all exhausted. Um, I feel like we might've gone over this. Okay. It's possible. Um, I, I, I don't remember the copyrights. I, I remember patents, <clears throat> finishing patents. Okay. Maybe well, what we I'll try to do in copyrights. That's possible. Um, Erica has a certain clairvoyance and an ability to see into the future. So there are some times <laughs> where it feels like a memory, but it's actually the future that hasn't happened yet. It's freaky. <laughs> freaky. Um, there we are. Okay, let's do this thing. Let's talk more. Um, Hmm. <laughs> we talked about patents. We talked about intellectual property uh, as a broad topic. Copyrights. What's the idea? I want to, can I just say, can I say one thing? Everyone's like, here we go. Um, I just want to say that the thing about intellectual property law is that the, to me, the law is always flawed, you know? There's, you know, it never, it's never quite up to snuff. It's never quite current with real technology. You know, it's never, um, uh, it's always just flawed. And the, the challenge is though, you know, what's the alternative is the, is the struggle. It's not enough. I don't think it's enough to just say, oh, this sucks. This is stupid. This doesn't, you have to make this voice and make that face, you know? Um, oh, this is a double. Whatever your, whatever your problem is, and that's fine. And it's okay to recognize, you know, those that have, were in my 3450 class understand that I believe in the principle that you got to start by knowing when things suck. And that's legit. But the problem is when you're dealing with legal systems, what's your alternative? Like, well, how do you, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, you know, what are you going to do instead? Right? And every time you stop and just go, um, are we getting, are we getting chat audio? Okay. We got mostly audio. Great. Okay. <clears throat> but, um, no, you know what I mean? So when, when people are like, you know, I don't think you should be able to, uh, you know, uh, enforce your patent unless you're producing product. Okay, so universities can't have patents. Professors can't have patents. You know what I mean? It's like, ah, it doesn't quite work, right? There's different skills. And you're like, well, how, you know, so it's just this over and over and over again. It's really hard, as I've noodled a lot about this whole field. It's true of copyright as well. What do you do instead becomes, I think, a very relevant question. So when we talk about copyright, let's go there exclusive rights to the author or the creator, right? Well, what does that mean? And there's a lot of subtlety. I brought out my books last time. They're over there on my shelf. But my big fat copyright law book, which is about yay big, um, you know, what does that mean? What does it mean, exclusive rights? What does it mean, you know, what does it mean to be the creator of an original work, right? Is it, what does it mean to be original? All of these issues have been debated and discussed and, and you know, 
uh, different legal cases and different rulings and Supreme Court and everything else. Um, so just understand that that's kind of a backdrop. Um, I have one in particular serious nit with current pragmatic copyright law implementation, which I'm going to get to. But the idea is, you know, the right to copy, distribute, and adapt. The idea, just like with, with patents, the idea was encourage you to disclose it as opposed to keeping it a trade secret. And then having disclosed it, um, you know, you've got a, a legal monopoly for a period of time. Copyright, same thing. Then it goes into the public domain. <clears throat> if you've ever seen uh, projects like, there's like the Gutenberg project, right, where you've got free books online. Uh, one of the reasons that there are free books online is that these things go into the public domain after after some number of years or so many years after the death of the of the artist or the author or whatever you know these things going which means that other people can like sell prints of that painting or uh you know produce their own edition you know print editions right why are there so many print editions of a lot of old classics right well, you know, it's you're not paying royalties to an author when you're when you're publishing, you know, the collected works of Epictetus. You know, there there's no royalties to anybody. You know, and uh, the other thing. So that's kind of the that's kind of the core idea. Um, and what you're really trying to do is protect the financial uh, return on investment to the inventor, the you know, or the creator, the 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 artist, the writer, the author. Um, and we'll talk about fair use, which is like, what are the exceptions? Like, well, can I even say the title of your book or do you own that too? Can I not even utter those words? You know, what do you do in practice? And then the other thing to just kind of keep in mind, um, if you try to, if you would, you know, imagine a world without copyright, you know, you have a word where, a world where, you know, somebody writes something, puts all the effort in, the creativity, you take their stuff, you stick your name on it. You know, and then you just send it out there, produce it. That's just classic, you know, classic copyright infringement. In, in academia, we call that plagiarism, where you take somebody else's work, stick your name on it. The issue there, in my view, has to do with um, representation. What are you representing, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Same thing in academia. I can cite your stuff all day long, put it in quotes, say, you know, as so-and-so said, quote, you know, cite to where it came from. I'm just, now I'm quoting somebody. I'm not passing it off as mine. You know, that's really the key. Um, so the other thing that, that I think most people don't understand, um, and again, and I've, let me just, again, put my little disclaimer. I'm not an attorney. This does not re represent legal advice. If you have, like, really true legal questions, you got to talk to an attorney and, you know, and or do the research and, you know, these things also change. So I'm trying to keep it a little bit broad so that the principles are not, you know, evolving <clears throat> so quickly. But typically, if you simply put a copyright notice, like, you know, whatever, just copyright 2020, Charles D. Knutson, then you, you're already copyrighted. In fact, even without saying that, there's a level of protection simply because it actually was you who did it. If you can prove that it was you that did it, you know, then, then you're good. What you have when you do a registered copyright is there's certain recourse that's available to you if there's infringement or somebody, you know, you know, rips you off or does something. There's different kinds of remedies available if you have registered the copyright. But even if you don't register the copyright, you own the copyright. Okay. I own the copyright to these slides. For example, even though this slide right here does not have a copyright notice on it, I still own the copyright to this slide. And if I can demonstrate it was mine and you stole it, ripped it off, whatever, you know, then there's potential recourse for me. Okay, let's talk about fair use. And again, at any point, you know, drop the comments, you know, give me audio comments, text comments. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, um, let me see back on, yeah, Denver just said, yes, on patent, it is 
a short-term monopoly. And I guess what I'd be curious about Denver is why that gets to you, what, why that really gets you. Um, oh, you sure. Know. Yeah, to yeah please. Yeah. Yeah, the argument is uh, to... The argument is that a patent can compensate for the overhead of research, right? Then, I mean, the amount that they put into research, that's known at the time that they file for the patent. You'd think that, okay, they they have, uh, you know, it, it, it could uh, justify that amount. But uh, in practice, it has nothing about just covering the overhead. It's about It's about getting as much profit as possible beyond that. You know what I mean? Like yeah, the, yeah. The argument is to cover the overhead, but the execution is not bound by that at all. No. Well, the, the argument is actually, the, the fundamental argument is to encourage disclosure. Oh, say more about that. Yeah. Well, and I think, I, I don't know, I think I talked a little bit about it last time, but the idea is, look, you could just keep this quiet, like, right? Like, for example, let's say I invented anti-gravity boots, Right which would be a very cool thing. Not with flames, okay? Strapping a propane tank on fire to your back to me is, you know, cool, not quite Iron Man, although there are flames in his hands and stuff, whatever. I'm saying I invent anti-gravity boots that are very, very cool, right? And I can start selling those, but the question is how did you do it? Now let's say my factory explodes and I die in that explosion and all the documentation and the anti-gravity boot invention is lost to the world for another 50 years until somebody as smart as me invents the, you know, reinvents the anti-gravity boots that I created, right? So that's a, a, a crazy scenario. But the idea is that the, the ability to have a patent um, gives me an opportunity or an incentive to disclose the invention while it's still on the market. I'm like, hey, everybody, here's, I'll tell you how I did the anti-gravity boots. Um, but in exchange, I just want freedom from competition on, not, not on the concept of anti-gravity boots, but on my method of anti-gravity. You can't just like read my document <clears throat> and go, oh, let's go, let's go do that. We'll do that too. So I do get a, I do get a limited monopoly, a monopoly for a period of time. Um, but the monopoly, uh, again, it's, it incentivizes me. If I don't have that monopoly, what I'll do is I'll keep, um, I'll just keep it a trade secret and you can buy my anti-gravity boots and you can try to reverse engineer them. You know, there's some times where you can't, re where you can readily reverse engineer and now discover the trade secret, right? And in that case, the trade secrets don't protect you much. There's others where you can bust your butt trying to reverse engineer it, but you're never going to quite you know, have it, right? Maybe, I don't know, recipe for Coke or whatever. Um, and so when you have the situation where reverse engineering is, is, you know, more readily available, patenting gives me more protection for my intellectual property because I did, in fact, create this thing, um, you know, that nobody else did. The dilemma begins to come into, the, obviously, the gray zones, right? When you're patenting everything in the world, when you're patenting laser pointing at a cat or, you know, a lot of software patents, I think, you know, have serious struggles with, uh, with originality, um, like the LinkedIn patent, that would be a really, really good one. And so when you get a kind of overloaded with it, cause they're also supposed to be novel, they're supposed to be, you know, differentiable and not an obvious next step. So how many next steps does it have to be away? How many hops away from right now does it have to be? And then it becomes very subjective, and that's the struggle with all of that. You know, it's easy to say something nobody's done, and suddenly they do it, and it's anti-gravity boots. Um, one other thing I just want to kind of push back on, on Denver, the, the, the motivation of the patent system is not, in my opinion, um, based around a desire to maximize economic return to the the inventor okay it is to right. minimize the economic the unfair economic damage to the inventor so for example 
There was a book uh, that came out shortly after Harry Potter was released uh, and began to become the, the amazing phenomenon that it, that it became. There was a book published in, I think it was in Russia, and <clears throat> it featured a girl who was a wizard who rode a broom, who went to a school. You know, it was essentially a complete ripoff of the hair. She had a scar in her head, you know, the whole thing. It was a complete rework of Harry Potter, and her name was Tanya Grotter. Okay? Now, uh, Tanya Grotter didn't hurt. Um, well, the, the, sorry. Tanya Grotter, having or having not having Tanya Grotter on the market, had nothing to do with you know, somebody else trying to make J.K. Rowling as much money as possible. That, that's not it. But to the extent that there is, you know, that there's negative impact on a market, right? You, you basically rip off my invention. Now you're producing it and now you're taking royalties and revenue. Or let's just say I take a CD and then I copy that CD. I produce my own CD of somebody else's music. It's Boston's first album, let's say. And then I just start selling that for 40 cents a pop online, right? And then people are buying that and getting the same quality as if they dropped 10 bucks or whatever. Um, now I am, you know, I'm violating copyright law in that case. But I'm, in, I'm basically, you know, costing uh, money, you know, potentially, right, for the, for the artist. The part where the artist makes money or doesn't make money is, you know, and, and maximizing the upside... I think that's just the artist's own business, and that's just called being a business person. Uh, I think that the law is more about mitigating the downside uh, protection. And as always, feel free to disagree as well, but that's kind of, that's my take, Denver, on that. Can I say two bits? <clears throat> yeah, please. So I, I just kind of go in my mind, like back to the beginning, right? Before patents were a thing and how it would have worked, Right. And for me, the idea is, okay, well, if I have this great idea, I spend years, years developing something. I develop it, and Joe Blow over here just copies and pastes, and he owns a factory. Now, all of a sudden, he makes the profit. I don't. I go out of business, and he continues. And that's yeah. business, sure. But the real, the real bad part is then what does the society do around that? They yeah. all say, hey, if I try to be innovative and make new things – I have to make up profit for all of the work I put into that plus the production. Well, if I'm just a copycat, I just have to do production. That's it. And so right. no, it will discourage people from being genuinely productive in, you know, in, in yeah. a genuine sense. Well, and I feel like that's right on. Um, and it also recognizes the fact that there are different skill sets. Production is a skill set. Distribution is a skill set. Sk sales, right? And, and creation and invention is another skill set. Engineering is a skill set, right? Turning into a production line, right? There's, there's skill being applied at every step. And if you'd made any sort of mandates, it'd be like saying, you know, you can't copyright your book unless you are willing to personally publish it instead of transferring that copyright to a publishing company. And you know what I mean? Getting, letting them share in the profit because they're going to distribute it and do artwork and you know all the every other you know all the other things that go along with it the struggle to me is usually when you get to the gray zones you can always find an edge case that is going to uh, you know kind of piss everybody off differently you can always get your way out to the edge cases the edge cases aren't the core case the core case is somebody literally takes my book tears the cover off sticks their cover on and produces it and distributes it as their own, that's your starting point. Is that okay? You got to go, no, probably not okay, right? Um, and one of the interesting things is if you're a, you know, we're all in the software industry, but if you're a software manufacturer, let's get back to copyright. Um, if you're a software company and, uh, you know, and somebody can just simply take your, your software, push it out, reproduce. It's been a lot of work over the years to try to sort of, in, in a sense, enforce the fact that you actually have a license to run this thing. Back in the day, you had floppies, you know, and if you had the floppies, you were okay. 
then then you would have and now in 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 countries historically and i do not have a uh, i have no finger on the pulse like right now for what you know who's who's playing well and who's not playing well with others in, in the international and the global scene but historically countries with weak copyright protection uh, tend to have lower innovation you know because if I'm in you know whatever I don't even know which countries you know right now have good or bad um, but if I'm in con you know country X and I produce my my work and then in country X everybody just grabs it and there's like 10 versions of my book out there and somebody's got a better publishing or somebody's got a better you know editor and somebody else has got a better sales whatever and bookstore channels and all of a sudden I'm just I wrote it and I'm sitting here making nothing and everybody else is just really ripped off you know there's no credit due in the same way that if somebody took my house I'm right now selling my house if somebody took my house, which is real estate, pro that's real property, right? So there's intellectual property. I mean real property in the sense of real estate, right? But, or it's like a car, which is personal property, right? If I, have, if I have the anti-gravity boots or this cool piece of software or this cool game, right? And, and somebody just simply takes it and then just starts distributing it and making money for it. You know, that's not dramatically different then somebody comes, takes my car, and there's no like titles on cars. You steal my car, you just resell my car. You know what I mean? Even things like you know uh, the dip thing. You know, over over time, you know, we've tried to make it more difficult to resell a stolen car. In essence, to sort of try to take the profit motive out of you know playing playing badly. But it is true that in countries historically, where um, where there's been bad copyright protection, there's been bad innovation. You know, these are not the countries where you're tending to see great literature, great software, great innovation, great inventions. And in countries where you have robust intellectual property systems, you tend to see innovation because there's a level of protection. If I do this thing and I push it out there, I'm not just going to be just giving it away, right? And I wanted to say one other thing, and then I'm going to double back to some comments, um, which is the comment's been made, I think, several times, um, maybe almost by everybody who's made a comment so far about, let's say I spend a bunch of time. Okay, true, fine, fine, but let's say I didn't. Let's say I'm just the smartest freaking guy in the whole world, and you can tell because you can see my Santa beard, you know, you're like, that guy seems really, really smart, and you're right. And so I'm so smart that one day I just, you know, take this pen and, I, and, a, and a piece of bailing twine and then I craft them into a, a you know, a, a fighter jet. And it's amazing, right? Out of $2 worth of raw materials, I have created a fighter jet. That would be amazing. It would be certainly a market for that, okay? Right? But let's just say that the idea hit me like in a moment, similarly with songs, right? Some of the great, great songs. I, I, I watched a video recently, uh, just interviewing, talking to Paul Simon about Bridge Over Troubled Water, you know? And, and but, but that's not the only one. I mean, this happens all the time. That, you know, you're a songwriter, you're living in this world, and all of a sudden you're just like, you know, almost like message coming in, you know, for a songwriter. And you're just like, and you start writing it down or you start playing it or record it or whatever, right? It hits you, the inspiration hits you in a moment. And there are amazing number one hit tunes over time that were written in five minutes. You know, they were, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> What's can that? Can I play devil's advocate there? What's that? So can I play devil's advocate there? Uh, yeah. Because I feel like that's <coughs> pretty unfair. Because it's not like me, who's never played the violin before, will also go, oh, I think of the next Mozart piece and write it. I spent hours learning that talent. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's just... right. So it's still the time. It's the still an amortized there, investment it's... to be exactly. that person. Exactly. Yes. Totally time. fair. Totally fair. So there really is that, that investment to get that education or to acquire those skills or to be that person. Because it takes Paul Simon 
to write Bridge Over Troubled Water in 10 minutes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And none of us working our entire lives would ever write that song, you know. So that's totally, totally fair. And really, and I was just trying, but I was trying to take the, the how long I worked at this thing as a form of compensation. Because to me, that is, that's, uh, whenever we talk about anything economic, the notion of how much time you spend being a sort of a linear framework upon which to base compensation, irrelevant, in my opinion, right? How long it took LeBron to be able to hit that shot, if nobody else can hit that shot, and LeBron, you know, just walked out of the crib with that one day, I don't care. You still get to, enter, you know, you're still worth a market value because of just a thing you can do that nobody else can do. It's a market What's scarcity, the, right? Can I come back at you again? Is that yeah, okay? hit me, man. I'm ready. All right. But that's comparing a talent developed to a programming where if you develop a talent, once it's done, person with no talent can do it. The LeBron shot only he can do. Yes. But anybody can do these other skills that we need to be paid for. It's not fair if anyone can do it. Right. Anybody can take this code. There's no code on here. But anybody can take this code, right, and make a little company and upload it to the App Store, right, and rip me off, whether you're the programmer or not, what you're saying, which is totally, I think that's an absolutely fair point. Totally fair. Um, yeah, so comparing, yeah, exactly. You can't compare LeBron's shot that you're right. If you're the only person that can do it, that's fair. You you deserve to be compensated to be the one person yeah, in the world. Yeah. But in most intellectual property, it's not something that you're the only person in the world that can do. In fact, most people can do it. You are just the first to do it. And that's where we're trying to get patents and things to balance out, I think. Interesting. That's a lot. I think that's, I think that's a big chunk of the case. I don't know that it's the product. I don't even know. I don't know what the percentages are. But like, let's say, for example, because um, because really it comes down to when you talk about copyright, let's talk about fair use. Segue, <clears throat> brilliant segue. Um, if I am, let, let me talk about this one. And then again, there's so many great comments and I'm, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to have to go thin. I apologize. <sighs> let's take um, as an example uh, the, the effort, let's take, I, I mentioned earlier Boston's first album, one of the greatest albums in the history of rock and roll music. I, I don't think there's any question and nobody would argue that. The only question is where would you put it? <clears throat> top 10, I would put it in the top 10 of most amazing and incredible rock and roll albums. Um, I don't think there will ever be another uh, Boston's first album because there will never be another Tom Schultz and music will never again be at that nexus where that was. You know what I mean? There's a lot of convergence of things. Whereas uh, somebody eventually would have coughed up, you know, uh, calculus. Somebody would have eventually coughed up quantum mechanics. You know what I mean? But these are more like natural law kinds of things. Mathematics, science, more, you know, more laws of nature. Whereas the other is more kind of creative artist. And that's why, you know, we were rocking some Mozart, right? Has there ever been another Mozart? And how long has that been? You know, that's been several hundred years. I don't think there ever will be, you know, maybe, maybe could. But anyway, um, but, but here's the interesting thing. If I simply take their, if I take Boston's music, and uh, which I saw them in concert live in 1979, 78, 78, 79. It was amazing. It was incredible, actually. Um, I mean, that was like absolute heyday, second album. It basically just came out. Okay. If I take, uh, you know, a CD, which is nigh unto a master tape master copy right it's not not perfectly but it is pretty not bad and i just simply produce that and then i sell it or i undercut their market somehow somewhere somehow right if i have a if i just let people into a stadium that other people have paid to get in and i'm just half the people there were just let in the side door because i just decided to you know anything that i'm doing that's undercutting the the legitimate business model right of 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 the arts, whatever that form happens to be, 
you know, feels to me like this is, this is a, uh, that's a problem. Fair use exists to recognize the idea that there's a limited use of that material without permission. That's the key. I don't have to get, right? So whenever anybody, you know, posts a, a copyright notice um, and it's like, you know, any unauthorized use of this without express permission, blah, 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 is forbidden by law, blah, blah, blah. Much of the time it's overstated because it doesn't give you sort of a legitimate window to deal with fair use, right? So uh, these are the categories, right? Commentary, criticism, right? Like I could do a thing that's called why this song sucks and it would be reasonable for me to play clips of a song to, com to comment about why it sucks and that would be fair use, right? Simply, simply uh, playing their song and kind of giving that away to the world when I don't have the right to give it away, not fair use, right? So news reporting, research teaching scholarship, right? If I'm using uh, recordings of information, uh, recordings of songs to create the next Shazam, right? And I'm using it in that form. That's again, fair use. It relates to research. Teaching. Now, this is where it gets into a really funky zone. And I'm, I posted a couple of videos earlier, right? Where I posted Rick Beato, um, who is, you know, really a musically knowledgeable guy. Um, I like Rick Beato a lot. And I like uh, watching his, his uh, YouTube channel. Mostly what I do when I'm watching Rick Beato is I'm just like, okay, that was so freaking cool. I have no idea what he just said. You know, I do not know still what a Mixolydian mode is, but I've heard him say it like half a dozen times, right? You know, I don't even know what the diatonic scale is. I, I don't know any of this stuff, right? I do know what the circle of fifths is. I'm just saying my music theory is really, really weak, but Beato is like stratospheric. He does a thing called What Makes This Song Great? And it's one of my favorite uh, aspects of Beato's YouTube channel, right? Because you pick a song you already know, uh, or maybe when you don't, but I mean, you know, like here's a song you already know, and then he's teasing it apart, you know, like he did one right once with was More Than a Feeling by Boston, right? And which is an amazing song, but when he brings in his producer, music theory, and all the rest of it, bring that knowledge to bear, you're like, okay, look right here. Then he shows you something, and you're like, oh my gosh, that I, I, I always loved it, and I never knew why. Right? That's teaching. It's commentary. It could be criticism. It's also teaching, right? Anyway, the challenge that if you're, if you're, um, if you're YouTube, you got to come up with policies, right? To avoid the, the negative aspect of wholesale copyright infringement while preserving fair use. And in my own opinion, sitting here right now, this could change as I learn more or become, you know, better educated about whatever. Um, I feel like the fundamental policy kind of oversteps in the sense that it doesn't carve out enough legitimacy for fair use. And what I would, what I would like to see done is something that's been proposed by others, not by me, um, is almost like you, you earn your fair use badge. If you're Beato, you just demonstrate that this is how I do what I do. Keep an eye on me, but these are the boundaries and it's okay. And you carve that out. And then you have, you know, you know, you can be, you know, kind of operate with impunity. Otherwise what happens is, you know, there are some, there are literally some artists that he will be like, okay, the, this next song or the top 10 guitar intros or whatever. This next song is by a band that I'm not going to name um, and I'm just going to give you two chords. And when you hear the two chords, you'll know the song. And, and then he'll do the thing, the bling bling. You're like, oh yeah, sure enough, I know the song. And then he's like, I'm not going to say anything more because I don't want this video to be taken down and blocked. And he calls them notorious blockers. Beato's a teacher, okay? He's a professional teacher, but he's a teacher. I'm a professional teacher. You know, so I'm just saying, I think in that, that, uh, policies <clears throat> that lead to that level of kind of 
uh, paranoia and overreaction, I think, are just damaging. Now you're working against that whole idea, right? And then, and further, further, what happens, you know, what happens, um, sorry, I got distracted, I got distracted by the, the axis of awesome, uh, which I'm going to have to watch later. But um, what, what's interesting is there were stories, and I think, again, I posted some about it, right, where uh, these two guys run this channel and they, and they do a reaction channel to uh, In the Air Tonight, Phil Collins, I talked about this last time. And, and then, the, then the song charts, and the same thing happened recently with Fleetwood Mac and some cranberry juice commercial. I never saw it. I, I mean, I knew of it. I just like never had a moment in which I was like, that's the best priority I'm going to use my time for right now. But, but, you know, again, and it was a little bit ironic because I think that Fleetwood Mac tended to be notorious blockers. But all of a sudden, you start charting and making money. But, you know, it's like, you know, last time we were here, I don't know if, whether, if it was this class or the previous one, 2810, where I was playing a song by, by Oingo Boingo and praising this. I played a, a minute or so. I praised the song, said I loved it, you know, and, and exposed you guys to this. You know, if any of you were just like, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't take anything away from Boingo. I did get a copyright notice on that, by the way. Um, I get copyright notices anytime I use music, including when I'm the performer. I've even gotten for Ashokan Farewell, uh, where, where I was actually the performer, me and, and uh, Josh Dutton. Um, and we got a, it wasn't a takedown notice because I'm not a commercial paid. That, that opens up a lot of things when you're not, uh, I was on guitar. I was on guitar, acoustic guitar. And uh, I'll play it, for, I'll play it for our outro. It's, it's probably about time that we, uh, you know, right. And to me, that's absurd, but I don't know what the guidelines are, the laws that relate to my, my, the right I have to pr publicly perform, you know, and in all fairness, what I need to do better at is posting, wait, is that my Anishikan farewell? No. Oh, is that how far we got? Yeah, right. No, I agree with Eric. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. But is there any, you know, is there anything that comes back to me as the artist if they make money? If somebody takes my song that I wrote, right, and whatever, and then Rihanna, because you know how I would write songs for Rihanna, and then all of a sudden, or as I like to call them, Beyonce, um, uh, if I wrote songs for Beyonce, and then they like took the song I wrote and each one turned it into a number one hit. I think I should be, I did copyright, you know, I did write the song compensation back to me royalties. I think that makes sense. That's the middle ground, right, Eric? You know, um, but they don't have a copyright on my performance, but they do have a copyright on the song I was performing. Anyway, gray zones, gray zones. Okay. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. This is so this is cool. It's a rich topic. It's really, really a rich topic. But, <clears throat> okay. Where are we at? Boom. Wait. Oh, this is how far we got last time? Oh, you're right. <laughs> okay, we already talked about it then. Excellent. Let's talk about trademarks. Uh, trademarks. Brands, marks, logos. Um, you have the, the, little, the little T with the, you know, no. Is that what it is? No, it's the... It's the R. What's the trademark mark? No, it's TM. I'm an idiot. It's the, it's the little TM. It's like, well, there's also a registered trademark. Um, oh, yeah, dumb. I'm such an, I'm so, listen, it's late in the semester. Right there. There's the trademark. There's a registered. Ah, anyway, the idea with that is like, okay, let me go. No, by the way, I think that it would be a stupid, the, the, the idea that if somebody like, plays a couple chords from a song, they get blocked. Then I think that Dasani, this, by the way, is my favorite brand of water. Why should I have a different, I don't know. I have a favorite brand of water. It, it's based on a number of things. But Dasani. Now, if we did the same things with trademark that YouTube does with copyright, then this video should receive a notice Right. And maybe even be taken down and blocked because I showed the Dasani brand. That to me is where this whole thing becomes really stupid. 
right? I'm literally selling Boingo to you guys. I'm selling Foo Fighters to you with regularity. You know what I mean? I'm selling Mozart to you. I'm selling the product basically and that and I'm risking being taken down, but I can sell Dasani water, which is delish or what else I got? Chapstick, the green, right? Look at me. Look at me. I'm a rebel. Favorite pen. What is this thing? The pilot well, you know what, if, in other words, if it's a trademark product, you look at that and you're like, oh, that's just called advertisement. People pay money to get this moment. But if I play, you know, if I personally play five chords of some song in order to teach you the chord progression, uh, I risk having the video taken down. To me, that's absurd. Yeah, that's right, Michelle. Dr. K is living dangerously. That is how I live, actually. That is how I live, dangerously. Okay. Whew. Here's the things. Okay, that's that's trademark. It's distinctive sign or indicator, right? So that when you see that logo, wherever it is, when you see that logo, right, you in, instinctively, chapstick, you instinctively kind of know that logo. You know, it, 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 it sinks in. And the key is you can't have... Um, Confusion is the bottom line. Here's a true story that I don't know if you know this story. Um, um, but back when uh, Apple Records was created by the Beatles, there was a record label called Apple Records. Okay, that was the that was the label on which the Beatles songs. Uh, I remember, don't remember exactly which year that happened, but. They were doing other things and they created their own record label and then did all their albums on the Apple record label. And then when Apple computer showed up in the, when was that, late 70s, mid to late 70s? Mid 70s, I don't remember. But when Apple computer uh, showed up, the Beatles actually sued, or lawyers representing the estate or the, the, the whatever the, the entity was, uh, sued uh, Apple for trademark infringement. And the idea was, we already own Apple. It's Apple Records. And now you're going to love this. Okay, get ready for it. Apple's argument was, we're not in the music business. Which was true at the time. We're not in the music business. We're in the software business, computer business. Computer primarily, right? Um, and eventually, but you know, you know, the other thing that's really important is that you can't trademark words that just exist in the language. You can't trademark the word Apple. There you go. You cannot trademark, and that was their really kind of ugly but, but very iconic um, thing, right, which was on the, on the two sides of the vinyl. Is that, a, that's, is that a picture of vinyl? Probably is. No, they didn't swipe. No, they didn't swipe the logo directly, other than the fact that it was an Apple. Go, go pull up the Apple sketches. I'm, I'm totally disagreeing with you. Um, Apple did not just swipe the, that was the, that was Apple records just there. Somebody, somebody pull up, you know, the original Apple, it was like a rainbow Apple with a bite out of it from a profile view. It, 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 it was other than the fact that it was an Apple. I'm calling you out sketches. You understand that, right? I'm calling your action right now. Defend yourself, defend yourself, sir. Um, but no, anyway, but then, and then this is what the interesting thing, um, uh, man, the resources you're dropping are so good. It's amazing. And unfortunately must, must press forward, um, slides to complete. Uh, you know, I've never completed a lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Franklin. That, that's it. Um, Yeah, that was the original Apple logo right there. Um, where am I getting? Where am I going with all this? Oh, then when Apple launched the iPod and got into the music business, uh, and then they launched the Apple, what did we call that thing? What was it? iTunes. They launched iTunes and they got, and they got into the music business. 
And for a very long time, my understanding is that in part out of spite or Apple was pissed or whatever, Apple Records was pissed at Apple Computer that you couldn't get Beatles music on iTunes. They were like, no, F you, no Beatles music on iTunes. You want to play this game? Whatever, you know. And then somewhere along the line, I think that the Beatles folks kind of recognized that, that having some weird, you know, some weird spitting contest about your defunct record label and this, these people that want to sell your music for money, maybe you were fighting the wrong battle. So you get into some weird dynamics. Okay, let me keep going. I'm going to go powering, powering through <clears throat> trade secrets. These are, these, these are the categories. Formula, practice, process, design, instrument, pattern, or compilation of information which is not generally known or reasonably ascertainable by which a business may obtain an economic advantage over competitors. Recipe for Coca-Cola. The, the seven herbs and spices. How many herbs and spices are there supposed to be in the original KFC? Seven? There were some number of herbs and spices. Um, cop, trade secret protection never expires because you don't have to register the actual thing. You don't register it. You just keep it secret. And you enforce it by non-disclosure. Yeah, and I want to just say something, Seeds. Um... Buying albums, having the files downloaded indefinitely for one-time price, yeah. What's really, really interesting, and we can talk about this later, oh man, if you look at the music industry when you talk about how downloading was hurting the music industry, there's a lot of conflated data in all of that. One of the things that happened, and I was part of this generation, that had all of our albums on vinyl back when that was the thing, we didn't like it, um, and even though that's cool for your generation, it's more nostalgia but it's still, in my view, not necessarily a superior sound. Depends on the environment. But then when vinyl started to go away, but CDs showed up and we needed to have, you know, CDs you could cake in your car or whatever. The medium changed, right? Then many of us just replaced the whole library piecemeal, a little at a time, with CDs. So CD sales were actually amplified uh, uh, sort of unnaturally for a stretch. And then when that saturation was done and my generation had finished buying all of our vinyl on CD for now the second time, right? If you hadn't already bought it somewhere in there on 8-track or cassette, you know, then things started to taper off as the next generation came up and was not replacing their vinyl, but, but was simply buying new. Okay, there was an abnormal uh, spike. Okay. All right. Okay, so, um, yeah, you enforce it by non-disclosure, basically. You just sue people if they disclose it. And there's no protection if somebody can just go pull it off. If you can figure out the recipe for Coke, fine. Go be Pepsi or whatever, you know. You want to go be Mr. Pibb and try to imitate Dr. Pepper? Knock yourself out, but you're still Mr. and they're still Dr., and Dr. Pepper still wins. I'm sorry, Mr. Pibb. I, I, I have to reject you now. Um, but there's no protection. Be, you know, but that's, that's kind of the choice. Now, this actually deals more with employment. Yeah, I heard the, heard the ding. Oh, I had a quick question. Yeah, hit me. So if someone reverse engineers the exact recipe, can that new company then patent that recipe? I don't know. I don't know. I truly don't know. Look it up, Tyler. Okay, I'll look it up. Because that seems like Figure a really disadvantage to put your economic advantage in a trade secret. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll look it up. Yep. I listened to a podcast once. It might have been, it might have been Freakonomics Radio Podcast, which I also recommend. Uh, and again, if this was music, I could be banned by saying the word Freakonomic Radio Podcast. But I like the podcast. I believe that was one, it might have been the one where they, somebody actually found what they believed to be the recipe for Coke, like, you know, somewhere, somehow, and then like went and brewed a batch, you know, and it was like not that good. I don't know. So it probably wasn't it, but there's also manufacturing processes, right, that lead to just that beautiful combination of, of 
caffeine, carbonation, and carcinogens. You know what I mean? In just the right combo to make you feel like, mmm, that is the best part of waking up right there. Okay, uh, let me talk about employment agreements. Typically, and then we can also, where am I on time? I'm sucking on, I'm always sucking on time. No, we're better than I thought. I was thinking 6.30. We're better off than I thought just a minute ago. Speaking of trademark. Um, yes, Wyatt. You, you mentioned the best part of waking up. And that actually is, made me wait, is what? think of Folgers. Folgers in your cup, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now you can trademark, I'm sure Folgers trademarked that expression. The best part yeah, of waking up. Yeah, just like up. Uh, Red Bull did for... Uh, gives you wings, it would say it also lost the lawsuit because it didn't actually give you wings. No, uh, you made that up. I that's why I heard at least. No, no, and you that's gotta partially give me... why they changed it to three eyes, if I remember <laughs> no. right. But that's no, why Wyatt. I heard. I can't speak one hundred percent. Wyatt, you gotta go get me some chapter and verse on that, okay? That sounds to me like urban legend or the telephone game where the story changes until eventually now you know uh they were sued by Buffalo Wild Wings for using the word wings and then they were all sued by the band Wings, which was Paul McCartney's post-Beatles band. And they were sued by the estate of the late Icarus, who infamously made Wings. Now, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't believe you, Wyatt. Look in general? Uh, it's not the first time. I'll just say that. <laughs> uh. Excellent, excellent, Michelle. Okay, right now Michelle wins the thread so far uh, with uh, uh, Zach, unpronounceable last name, Gaffinakis. I don't even know, right? How you spell it? How you say that guy's name? Um, yeah, I'd like to sue someone, please. And then there's another link just to back it up. Okay, there we go. Let me see. Red Bull drinkers can claim ten dollars over gives you wing lawsuit. Okay. Uh, that that's just evidence to back up my first original post. You, okay, but that doesn't mean that it was because it didn't actually give you wings, Pulse unless that's really what it says. Uh, I don't okay. Know. Red Bull will to pay ten dollars to customer. Da, 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 da. The drink didn't actually give them quote unquote wings. No, seriously. <laughs> yeah. Why? That's like literally the header you, of the uh, the post. You have been re elevated back to. Um, I don't know. It's just slightly above Neanderthal. Master of obscure trivia uh, <laughs> title that you deserve so well. Okay, okay, that's amazing. All right, let's keep going. Employment agreements. You are going to go out into the workforce, probably. Some of you will go do other things, go to law school, go to other kinds of, you know, other kinds of schooling or other kinds of careers and not be in the software industry. So what I'm saying now is, is kind of relates to the probably 90% of you that are going to make your living uh, larger or small in the software industry, okay? Um, this is the difficult thing. You're being paid to learn, right? Remember the orders of ignorance? You're being paid to learn. You're being paid to produce intellectual property. And the intellectual property that you produce is owned by the company that's paying you your salary. Now, you don't have to live, well, you don't have to live with that. You don't have to put up with that, okay? But so long as you're, if I'm, I'm as an employer, I have the opportunity to say, well, if I'm going to pay you to make products, you know, to make whatever, uh, uh, video games for the phone that look like Flappy Birds, whatever, right? I, I do uh, flying bird-based games, you know? And we have this, uh, this company that I have called Flying Bird Games, that's actually brilliant. But imagine that I had a company called Flying Bird Games, right? And I wanted to employ like all of you, whatever, to come work for my company. And then you, on your own time, on your own time, right? Uh, and by the way, there's a difference here between whether you are exempt from overtime or not. Whether you're paid hourly is one aspect and being salaried is another aspect. Because one of the aspects of being salaried is look, you're, you're being paid not for the hours you work, strictly speaking, but for the ideas you generate, the things you create. So if I have the great idea, if I'm a marketing guy 
and I have the idea for the most amazing marketing campaign in the shower relating to my client who is Red Bull, right? I don't, and I'm employed by the marketing company that does all the Red Bull stuff, right? And I've, ins I've been inspired by doing research, understanding the market, right? And I've been paid to do all of that. I can't then go like on my, on my own, go contact Monster and say, I've got a really great idea for an ad campaign. You know, it would, that's, that's a, a little more of an obvious thing, right? It would be a conflict of interest. The question is how large or small are the conflicts of interest? That's the burning question. You know what I mean? Where do you draw the lines? On the, and, you, and once you get in, you get into the gray zones and the, and the really weird edge cases. And that's where it gets to be, you know, a little, a little crazy. And um, so generally speaking, if you're a software engineer and you are building software on your own, and you have an interest in a commercial application for the software, your company by contract, not by law, but by contract with you will have a right of first refusal. Meaning now, so when, when Woz created the Apple One and built his little computer, uh, he worked for Hewlett Packard doing hardware design. And so he first took the, took the Apple idea and went to his bosses at HP and just did what he needed to do to kind of disclose it. And, and they were like, we don't have any interest in it. And then they just kind of bless it and say, you're free to go market that or whatever. But a company is also based upon what you've signed for your employment contract, um, free to say, you know, again, if this is what the contract says, the company can also say, um, nope, that we have the right to that. And there are companies that are really anal about that. And, you know, the free market system says they probably ought to lose employees. That's what the market says by being unreasonable employers. Uh, cause in a free market system, you're not, it's not indentured servitude or con you know, conscripted labor. You are free to go to a competitor. You can go leave, go work somewhere else. Um, in fact, employment contracts, that uh, have non-competes in them, in my understanding, have generally been found to not be enforceable. And really in part because it gives way too much power, you know, to, to a company. If someone's like, look, your, your employment contract is stupid. I'm not, I'm gonna leave. I'm not, I'm gonna go take my stuff across the street to our competitor. And then the company's like, ah, you can't work in the medical equipment industry for five years. You know, that would be that would be a sort of absurd and the courts have tended to hold that those kinds of employment contracts uh, are not enforceable. So even if you sign it, it's like, nah, not in this state, you know, that could never be enforced. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but basically, you have two choices. You can sign the document and and draw a paycheck or you can look for work elsewhere. Really, truly, that's because that's contract, right? The nature of a contract, employment agreement, employment agreements are contracts. Nobody has to sign a contract, right? In fact, here's a principle you can put in your book of Dr. Kism's, um, the power in any negotiation, contract or otherwise, every, every negotiation ultimately ends in a contract of some form, whether it's, you know, official, unofficial, written, non-written, verbal, just a gentleman's agreement, whatever, you know, whatever the thing is, you know, there's, um, all negotiations are headed towards some contractual understanding. Uh, the power in any negotiation is to walk away. That is the ultimate power in that negotiation is to walk away from the deal, to not sign the contract, you know? And, and then it becomes the law of least interest. Whoever kind of cares the least about the deal has the greatest power because the other one, right? But that's also the market doing what it does, right? Like, I, I want to buy your car. Uh, nah, I'm not interested in selling my car. I'll give you a thousand bucks. You're an idiot. It's worth 10,000. I am really, right? I'm not interested. You're like, I'll give you 8,000. You may have misunderstood me. I'm really, truly not interested. They come back 10,000. Yeah, I could sell it for 10 if I cared. I'm not, it's not worth the hassle. They come back and they're like, I really, really need to have that car. 
it was the original car that was on the Dukes of Hazard or whatever. And I know this, but they don't or whatever. And I'm very motivated. I'm like, I'll give you $15,000 for your car. Now you're like, okay. So you see how the market is actually, the market has caused a convergence. The, the free market forces have generated a conversion. I don't want the deal because your, your price is too low or whatever the compensation is, right? I'll buy the car for 5K, but I'll drive you to the grocery store for the rest of your life. You make your, whatever the deal is, when it is a good deal for both parties, you engage, okay? Employment is like that, okay? Um, you don't have to do it. So, um, <clears throat> here's a true story. I think it's been enough time that whatever, whatever time needs to have passed, but when I went to, when I went to work at Novell in 1989, um, I showed up and there was, you know, orientation. And it was at that point that I was finally uh, looking at employment contracts. And I thought that some of their employment contract stuff was a bit onerous. I thought it was not, I didn't like it. So I was just like, uh, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to chew on this. I need, to, I need to go study this or whatever. Yeah, no sweat, right? So I took it. I looked at it a couple more times and I was just like, I don't know. And I got busy or whatever. And then I realized that I never that I didn't sign it. Um, I don't even know legally like what's enforceable, right? That's where case law comes in. But <clears throat> true story. But I did kind of come to the conclusion that I didn't want to sign it, but I did like my job. <clears throat> About a year later, probably as a result of an HR audit or something, somebody you know pings me, sends me an email from HR, and they're just like, "Hey, uh, we were doing an audit. We don't have a copy of your employment agreement." I'm like, ooh, yeah, that, yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, let me, I'll get that taken care of. And that's all I did. I didn't do anything. And then, and then they didn't, and then there was no follow-up. And then another year later, the same thing happened. And I did the same thing. So I was now, I'm now four years working for this company with no employment agreement. Now, of course, I'm also not protected, right? But I was also, at, by this point, like, you know, whatever. If they're like, we're going to stop paying you. Okay, well, I don't know. So we reached the point at year four where somebody literally came down to my cube or my office, whatever, and they're like, hey, Chuck, you got you, you to sign this employment agreement. And I'm just like, yeah, let me, can you leave that with me? I'll, I'll take care of that. And they're like, no, we actually, you have to sign it like right now or we have to walk you out. And I was like, and I already knew I was going to quit. You know what I mean? So I was like, okay, and I signed it because I wanted to continue drawing a paycheck during the time, et cetera. Right? I'm just saying, when you, when you go to take a job, understand that there are employment agreements. They are of varying enforceability before the law. So do get an attorney who's a real attorney to, you know, to look, to just give it a review. Is there anything that I should be aware of? The other thing, I want to just say one other thing about contracts business contracts, never sign a contract with somebody that you would not do the deal on a handshake back when that was a thing. Never sign a contract with somebody where you would not have done the deal on a handshake. You put, well, you put into the contract a sort of a memorializing of the terms so you don't have decision rot, okay? Bit rot, we sometimes call it, right? There's decision rot where you forgot, like, no, you said you were gonna, no, I never said that. Yes, you did. Well, we just, we're, we're both good faith, but we disagree. Well, let's go, let's look at the contract. Oh, you know what? That really was kind of vague. Let's go back and figure out what we meant, right? You have, because the truth is, um, the truth is <clears throat> that when it comes time to, to, if you disagree and one of you is a big jerk, they're going to file suit. You're going to be in, and I've dealt with a bunch of these, right, as, a, as an expert witness. And now you're in court and they're going to say, that's not what that means. And it's like, that is absolutely what that means. And you agreed, you know, and now you're having to pull up emails like, see right here. But they were like, no, that's not what I meant. I, you know, and it's all kind of like, there's no contract in the world that is like so perfectly ironclad that, that you're going to avoid litigation. The contract's just there to give you ammo if you get to litigation. Contracts exist for when everything breaks down and goes to hell. My, you know, one of my kind of main corporate attorney that I use, 
you know, he's just like, we are not, we don't exist business attorneys. We don't exist for the good times. We exist for the bad times, you know, because uh, you can do all the, the right things, you know, um, when things are good. But if an employee decides to sue you, have you protected yourself? Or if you're the employee, right, and you need to sue the company, have you protected yourself? You know? <clears throat> um, all right, I'm going to keep going. Um, yeah, what else? What else? What else? This last part, recognizing the creative nature of engineering. You know, the fact that your best idea of the week is very likely not going to come to you while you are in your office with your hands on the keyboard. So, okay. Um, what else? What else? We talked about this already. Usually limitations on the nature of the work, right? If I want to go moonlight on the side, there are companies that actually have moonlighting clauses. Again, differing levels of, of enforceability. Um, I talked about right of first refusal. Um, sometimes companies will take an idea that you came up with and they're like, we love it, love it, love it. We are going to keep it, but we'd like you to maybe be stay and we'll spin it off and let you be, um, you know, involved. I want to just say Denver on your, on your comment. And I don't want to go too deep just on time. You know, I love the topic, but, um, I do think that, uh, you know, great depression, um, situations where there is an unequal, uh, you know, balance, right. In, in sort of negotiating power. I agree. I, I would say as big an issue as that was, it's still in the grand scheme an edge case. If that, I'm going to still call it an edge case. Not that it was like the, un, the uncommon case, but in the common case, for example, 2020, where there's, you know, if people are starving in 2020, it is, I'm going to make a bold statement that I think is true. But I think in 2020, if you're literally starving and you're an American, you're living in America, I think it's almost, at least as an American citizen, I don't know how it extends beyond that. I literally like don't know what the law is, okay? But if you're an American citizen living in America in 2020 and you're starving, I think it's nearly impossible to not get food stamps to get you food. I think that that is readily and rapidly available. And I may be wrong by just needing, you know, by, by misunderstanding my, under, you know, my experience and understanding with that whole space. And when that happens, that in part Food mitigates. Food stamps is a pretty low, pretty oh, low course. bar. But you said starving. I was responding to you said starving. Yes. In all fairness. Yes, it is. It is uh, to illustrate the point, not to say the, you know, right. the absolute. Of no, that, no, of course, uh, of course. Imbalance. But I was also using food stamps to illustrate the point because it's not the only social program meant to create and sustain, you know, to sustain life. You know what I'm trying to say? I was using it in the same way you were using starving. There are, you know, societally, we've mitigated a lot of those issues. Um, not all of them, certainly. And there is inequity, you know. For example, if you are amazing at your job and 10 companies want you and your company sucks, you have the negotiation advantage over them in that instance. If you suck and your company is powerful and they're willing to keep you and nobody else wants you, they're powerful. And that goes for, right, great economies have greater opportunity, worse economies have fewer places to, to bail out of the deal to go to. So those dynamics, I think, are absolutely, are absolutely real, you know, and at play. And I just want to say, so Dahlia, we can talk more about this as well. Uh, the inequity, depending upon what, you, what kind of inequity you're talking about, we talk a lot about, you know, income inequality and things like that. Uh, those do not necessarily equate to I lack, for example, if I'm working for the most powerful company in the world, I don't know who that is right this instant, but we know, who the, we know who the suspects are, right? And 20 companies want me. I am as equipped as I ever need to be. You know what I mean? From a, uh, from a negotiation perspective, right? If I'm working for Apple and, and they want to pay me this much and this is their struggle, this is their standard and their structure, and this other company wants to double my salary, in that negotiation, I am empowered because I get to leave the most powerful company in the world 
whether they make more money than me or this guy makes more money than I do, uh, in, in an individual negotiation, I think that power differential has to be discussed. And we're a little bit off topic because we got to do the slides. We got, we're, we're, we're slaves to the, to the slides. Um, anyway, we can talk. And there, again, this is so deep. And I don't mean to, when I like hit it and then get out, I'm, tr I'm not trying to be like a, you know, guerrilla, guerrilla debate strategy. You know what I mean? Hit in, punch you, run away real fast. I, you know, you all know I'm game for really deep, long, uh, as, as articulate and as intelligent as we can get and as, in, as, and as informed as we can possibly get. And I've had those conversations with, with quite a few of you. And I love it, love it, love it. And I'm not married to my current impressions. They're just kind of starting points. Okay, <clears throat> non-competes. I'm going to blast through these. Non-compete says you can't go use it to directly compete against your company. Very, com um, very common when you're at an executive level, when you're a C-level, you know, CEO, CTO, CFO, whatever, because you have a lot of information to the core of what your company's doing and a lot of vulnerability um, that you could go out and tell, look, they're, they're going to release a secret product nine months from now and it's going to kick your butt. You know, that, that creates an unfair advantage. That's when you tend to see... Um, uh, non-competes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they shouldn't be overly vague because there are non-competes that literally are like, you can no longer write software after you work for us. Bad. Non-disclosures. And we usually refer to these as NDAs. And I am just going to pop now. I'm going to go pop, pop, pop. And then we can talk more about it because we only got two more class periods. But next time when we talk about uh, kind of professional ethics, um, I do want, if you have questions about career or life, you know what I mean? Maybe we should do like a final and then pick a time where we can just kind of gather in for an hour and just talk about life and answer any questions about business and, and uh, whatever, profession, my view, you know, whatever that would be or sharing, whatever. Okay. Non-disclosures, NDA. Um, there is a practice that is very common where you're dealing with somebody you already trust and you say to them, this is the expression, okay, so we need to just consider this conversation at this lunch to be under friend DA. We call it friend DA. It basically says we could sign the paper, but we both always already know that NDAs are difficult to enforce in a lot of respects. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times you're going to hear stuff and you're going to be like, yeah, I already, I already had that idea. I already know that one. Okay, now can I go do it or did I just blackball myself? You know, it's tough. Typically, it's pretty standard. You've still got to have good faith together and never think, never believe that somehow the non-disclosure is somehow going to protect you. But if you have this thing, I've got this cool thing called, what was the name of my company again? Bird games, <laughs> what do they call it? What was my company? Bird games, flying bird games. Um, I think it was flying bird games. And then we go in, we have this NDA, and I tell you about this idea called flying bird games, right? Blah, blah, blah. And then you leave, and six months later, you release uh, you know, a new company called flying bird games or whatever. It, it, the more extreme it is, the easier it is to show that that was the case. The more subtle it is, like, because what are you going to say? Yeah, flying bird. I built a game that has flying birds. We had a lunch meeting where I said I was going to make a company called Flying Bird Games. And you're like, you doofus. Don't you understand that flying birds existed even before Flappy Bird? You know, like you can't, you can't trade secret the idea of flying birds, you know, et cetera. But if you had a name like Flying Bird Games and that was your company name, you could be like, no, I told you that. Okay. <gasps> Wait, I didn't realize that was the last slide, but it is. And we're like over time, but not unusually over time. Whew. This is a heavy, there's a lot, you know what I mean? There's a lot. When you deal with intellectual property, there is a crap ton of stuff. That's an official measurement. Um, yeah, man. Any questions? <laughs> oh, it's been a good run. I think that was, I don't know. I hope that was interesting. And, and at the very least, it's like hitting some bullets to spark ideas, you know, 
and maybe there's just some ideas that you've never really heard of or thought of or you know what I mean um, I like the topic I mean honestly it's one I spend a lot of time thinking about yeah same. Um, because uh, it, it, it kind of depends on what your perspective is on it uh, if you you know from from one end of the spectrum topic can be really demoralizing right <laughs> if you're an employee and you have a poor you have poor prospects with <clears throat> uh, with potential employers for example if there are a lot of applicants right then you're not likely to get a good negotiation like uh -huh. the just the stakes are not in your favor uh, on the other hand if you're the if you sympathize more with the employers I, I think you'd be you it'd be the opposite you'd be frustrated I think <laughs> that uh, that people are demanding um, well applicants are demanding more than the market justifies right yeah but but and let me actually and let me even calibrate that a little bit Denver um, they're they're perfectly aligned with the market but the market is just kicking your ass, you know. I mean, because that's the situation right now in your software market. You, you know, you're all as computer science types rolling out into the hottest tech market. Um, even with COVID, it's incredibly, you know, the salaries have never been higher, you know, never, ever, ever. Now, when you're somebody trying to start a company and you put your money into, you know, bootstrapping this thing and you just need a bloody website built right and you know and everybody wants a hundred thousand dollars a year to build and maintain your website or whatever to be your IT person or to be your tech you know what I mean I'm just saying that to me is also that the the flip side of that um, and I experienced that as an as I'm I'm both an employee and an employer right I've, I've drawn paychecks most of my life and I've had companies on the side most of a lot of my uh, adult professional life actually even as a kid um, so right it's that but that's that that's frustrating right that that idea that like I need to build something and I can't afford it I can't I can't actually do my idea because the fair market value for all of you is just higher than I can even reasonably do what I do you know but that's also just that's what the market says right is that fair Denver right you know just to kind of add a little you know clarifying twist to that because in other sounds words like uh, sounds like I, I think it's something that I naturally agree with I mean as far as just a uh, this is just how free market free market determines the pay it's not very um, you know it doesn't have any regard for need uh, no, of the no. individual, right? That's just the. That's just the. Uh, yeah, I think the it limitation does. Limitation of. Free I think market. it does on a macro level, but it doesn't at a micro level. Does that um, make sense? And to, uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm not thinking about it very hard right now because my, <laughs> my intuition is it's a complex, like a hairy oh, problem. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. A lot of <laughs> so, moving parts. A lot so of moving parts. I'm kind of like. I'm kind of brushing it aside, but yeah. I don't know if I agree or disagree. Yeah, it's totally just, fair. <laughs> I might get way into it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I and knowing uh, you and me, it's probably best that we not double click like right here, right now. But it is such a great topic, right? Because there are so. This is also why I really don't like the the heavy bumper sticker solutions to all these, you know, really crazy and complex, you know, uh, issues. You know, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. To to apply what we're talking about. Right. Like w what I mean is it can't be a bumper sticker solution because uh, <clears> I think <throat> there are two sides and it's easy to talk past each other on this. Topic. That's right. That's right. And if you uh, can't tear that down, tease that down right to the right. actual issues, the bumper stickers cause you to be like, you know, moving right. past each other. I've, My, I've heard. Uh, my my example is I've heard from a couple of my peers, and I've found out that I guess if there if you know uh, programming and you know biology, you can get a huge paycheck. Yeah, as that's a right. that's right. Bioinformaticist, I Absolutely. think it's called. That's right. 
uh, on the other, yes, thank you, bioinformatics. And, uh, Can I hop in there? Um, which, of course. Wait, so, <laughs> the bioinformatics stuff? I've heard the opposite, that if you do bioinformatics, you actually earn less money. It's then a, I don't run a computer scientist. I'm going Denver on this one. Um, well, that's what I would assume, but I've heard because a lot of it depends on what you go into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I don't you know, know, right? A, a I, lot of bioinformatics is more academic, and there's not as much money in academics as there is in just pure. Well, industry. but that yeah, but that the delineation is the job market, academia versus industry. I think Denver was saying industry versus industry. And so we got apples and apples, as it were, not to right. offend either Apple Computer or Apple Records, right? <laughs> no, and can I'm I just, just say, say? I'm just saying that because most of the jobs are more academic, there are less of the ones that pay a lot. Okay, that's totally fair. All right, and so and we need to wrap up, I guess. Uh, I wanted to say one thing, and I'm going to end on something like that. That is going to probably be it's going to come across very political, but I don't mean it to be. But I just want to say that I was shocked and pleased when I read what President Obama said yesterday about defund the police as a bumper sticker. He wasn't, right? The, to me, he was speaking about bad marketing due to bumper sticker slogans that cause people to talk past each other. And he's catching absolute hell from, well, he's being praised by the right, but he's catching absolute hell from the left, right? Who are like, no, my bumper sticker. How dare you offend my bumper sticker? And Obama, I don't think I don't think Obama has to apologize for um, you know leftist you know, lack of leftist bona fides. I mean, I think I think Obama is a is a committed liberal politician, thinker, guy. You know what I mean? I think he's also at the at the end of the day and in his core, really really smart guy and a very very rational guy. And he has often said things that, you know, that I'm just like, yes, thank you for saying that. And it's the things that bring, that kind of bring, you know, a little bit of balance. He wasn't saying that the issues aren't real. He wasn't saying there's not violence. He's not saying there doesn't need to be reform. He wasn't saying any of, it's Barack freaking Obama for crying out loud, right? Do we know who we're talking about right now? He didn't like retire and and become uh you know rando republican former president um he just simply said your bumper sticker is losing people that is really literally all he said in essence was that your bumper sticker loses people right and it is the problem i have by the way it's the same problem i have with make america great again i think that bumper sticker loses people energizes a certain base loses others. I, I think that almost every slogan, and I'm going to end on this one because I actually saw the other day, I was driving randomly somewhere, and there was a car and painted on the back window in, in like that, that car stuff, you know what I mean, that you can ride on windows that washes off. It was honk if you love Jesus. And, I, and I've heard a story that happened where somebody saw, sees the bumper sticker that goes, honk if you love Jesus. And they're like, you know, they're all like, I love Jesus. Uh -uh. You know, and the car in front just goes, asshole. You know? you know, you're like, I didn't really go, I think, the way that they kind of planned that one, you know. And the problem is that the, bunk, the bumper sticker lacks the subtlety and then the reactions come rolling and they get misunderstood. That to me is a classic, right? You honk a horn and the guy forgets he's got a Jesus bumper sticker on the back. And now he's flipping people off who are honking at him. You know, that, that to me is a great example of where, of even that, you know, uh, apart from the call to action, which is awkward in a bumper sticker, uh, you know, any call to action in my mind is, is awkward. But sloganeering, you know what I mean? It, it leads to conflict and, and you know, problems because it means we stop having real discussion at the subtleties and suddenly everybody's a Nazi, everybody's a racist and everybody's something. You know what I mean? Is that a good, is that a good place to end? <laughs>
Is that? I think it is. I think it's fine. And it's seven o'clock. And yeah, I everybody's got. Everybody's a Nazi. Everyone's a racist. I think that's a perfect place. Everybody's. <laughs> what are the others? Everybody's. I don't know, man. Everybody's a commie. Everybody's something. Man. Okay, thank you. I'm waiting for emotional permission. And Delia has just given me emotional permission. And Delia, I'm taking it. This is the level of respect that I have. And, uh, you know, for everybody else, model yourself after Delia. It'll go well with you, especially when it's great time. So, um, and okay. you're welcome. Uh, you're very welcome, everybody. Um, a quick question. Vote for Vader, a force you can count on. Excellent. That's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. And then everybody else, we're done. Anybody wants to hang tight? Is that Mason with the question? Yeah. Um, so when are we scheduling the writer's workshop stuff? I think I missed that. Oh, you did miss it because I'm, I didn't push it out. I have to still next two weeks. How's that? Perfect. Right. Um, I need to like drop. That's really on me, Mason. Uh, because I have been in a crazy death crunch selling my house and it closes on the 11th, like just too late for everything. And everything's been in chaos and mass hysteria for me. But I am making a note to myself. Um, yeah, that, that's really unfortunate timing. I was just curious. I, I thought maybe I'd missed it. So. No, you absolutely did Appreciate not. That. that is absolutely on me. Okay, do you see the note I just left to myself? Right here next to my laptop. Uh, it's just been like truly chaotic for me. And I, independent of everything else, which is already, you know, a thing. But yeah, thanks for the reminder, Mason. I really, really appreciate that. We'll get it. We'll get it somehow, somewhere. Okay, alrighty, I'm out. Oh, 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 I'm Asha Khan Farewell. I'm gonna play the uh, I'm gonna play the the song that got the uh, copyright notice with me actually performing it. Hang on a second. Let me get it's. And by the way, it is my illustrious friend Josh on the fiddle, and his fiddle is just everything, and my guitar is just filler. Anyway, this goes just a little over two minutes if you want to listen for the rest of it. And I'll look for the copyright notice as well. See everybody.
That's it. I'm out.